Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome back to another Knock On podcast, the Hump Day special. I'm doing this podcast for all of you out there who is slaving a nine to five job and it's Wednesday and there's nothing you want more than Friday to come. So I am going to do an extra podcast today. It's getting a little bit late, but I had seven minutes to start the podcast before everyone on the East Coast was off work. So I have officially fulfilled my promise to give you a podcast today. There's several questions that you guys had asked um, on some of the social media that I'm going to dive into. And yeah, I think we'll just kick off a little short podcast, see where this goes. Um, It's going to be pretty cool. The first question I've got is from Nicholas Wilcox, and he's asking, who are the winners for Leopard on Meth hashtag? That's a hashtag that I started um, through one of the live feeds, and there are so many good ones. I'm going to give out a bunch of prizes. Um, I've still struggled with the one that I want to win the most. So many are good. If you're an Instagram person, make sure you go to hashtag leopard on meth. Um, this was actually a saying that I came up with during a live feed based on all of the muzzy trocars that are used as the stars on this awesome American flag that my buddy Jonathan hooked me up with. So uh, I told people if they come in, it's going to cut you like a leopard on meth. So that's where it came from and if you made a cool drawing or a cool photoshop you're probably going to get something unless it wasn't up to par but for the most part there were several awesome ones and uh i laughed i laugh every morning i look at those (laughs) so i kind of don't want it to be over yet because they're hilarious um next question here is from Corey b moyer 16 Um, He's asking my opinion on purchasing a used X-Press Pro, Um, a guy near him selling one. So yeah, the sucky part about um, when I had the X-Press Pros available to purchase was the fact that they ran out of them. And honestly, I had to buy every one they had in order to get those. So it was an awesome deal, and I know there were you know close to a thousand of you that got them uh but they're gone now so i've it's actually been a subject i've been really debating what i'm gonna do um so if you can find one use one i know that i'm having trouble even getting one um for andy for uh his place out in montana because we're going to be doing a really cool event there which i'll talk about um on a later podcast probably with andy to be honest with you Uh, when we announce it but don't be afraid of buying uh, a used express Um, I did a podcast right when all the UPS and FedEx drivers come so shades will be going crazy if you can hear that in the microphone Um, it'll almost be as annoying as Mel Gibson with his pen on Joe Rogan's podcast and he was doing some real heavy deep breathing in the microphone as well so it was a cool podcast about stem cells but he definitely uh is fidgety and fidgeted a lot with that pen um so shades is going to be the same barking in the background but with the expresses make sure you know you want to stick with the express pro the express archer was a little bit less grade of an express Not particularly my favorite, how everything locked down. I was a big fan of the Pro. The other thing, too, is make sure that it is an Express Pro, the black ones with the red wheels, because the older Expresses, the silver ones, they actually um, don't fit the newer style limbs like they should. So make sure you pay attention to that. Um, Specialty Archery uh, makes a pretty cool press as well. I was thinking of getting one of those just to try it. Um, Otherwise, Last Chance Archery also makes um, a bow press that fits the newer style limbs if you buy the brackets which pivot in for uh, the new limbs. So don't be afraid to get it. Just look at it. Make sure it's all intact. And if you can go pick it up, that would be wise because... 
A lot of them, when they ship around to people, they end up getting damaged in shipping. So you're going to want to avoid that uh, by getting it yourself. Make sure you remove those handles and the wheels if you can. Uh, take a few minutes. It'll help you in transportation and all that good stuff. Uh, my man TNT Taylor is saying, can you, can you critique my latest shot process with the knock to it? Um, and the, my new thumb position because he watched uh, the last live feed or listened to the last podcast. I think a lot of you out there are utilizing the little technique that I told you in regards to marking the position of your thumb trigger so that as you hold that, you know exactly where your thumb is going to move to that release as you pull through, uh, which is going to be really, really helpful. Um, TNT, I did make a comment on your uh shot looked awesome uh looked like you were coming through that thing really smooth um the one thing that i'll tell you is uh as you're drawing the bow pay attention this is something that a lot of people do they'll draw back and have a very good draw cycle in other words as you for those of you listening you're not watching so it's harder i'm explaining it but as you raise your bow and you draw your release hand back to your face, draw and keep your face pointed directly at the target. And when that release stops, get in the habit of bringing the release hand over to your face. A lot of people get in the habit of drawing back and then bringing their head back to the release and then adjusting their head position until their hand is in the correct position on their face in reference to their anchor position. But there's an important reason why I don't like people to do it that, that way. And the reason is, is when you learn to draw back and the bow stops and you actually bring that release hand over to your face. So in other words, the release has stopped it should stop about two inches away from the face. As you just move it straight to the face, you're actually lifting that elbow and raising that shoulder into a position that transfers the load from your lat up to the rhomboid in the center of your back, which is gonna be the muscle that I really want you to focus on as you pull through the release. When you pull and you stop and then you adjust your head and settle into that position, one, your rear elbow runs the risk of coming down a little bit lower than what I would like it to. And then also you run the risk of leaning back slightly or even bringing your neck behind the center line in order to come into that draw. So be careful of that, my man. Other than that, it looks... Uh, really good one thing I've got here for those of you who are watching this right here is a bow I'm holding a bow that just came in today it is the brand new Hoyt RX1 Ultra uh, well yeah I guess it would be a Redworks Ultra I guess it'd be the RX1 Ultra yeah they do call it the RX1 still Ultra um, this bow is sweet I've got uh, black carbon limbs with the ridge reaper riser um, got it tricked out in all flow green strings some flow green accents um, some of them are actually going to be coming off but this is going to be the bow that i'm going to build for matt newton who was one of the original high build bidders for um, the hurricane relief project down in houston and uh, right now, he has been using Frankenbow as a temporary. This will be his new actual Franken, the Ultra Frankenbow. Um, I nicknamed this thing the Enforcer because this is going to be an 80 pound bow that we're going to build with some 600 plus grain arrows. And I told him that this thing is going to be all the man he needs to get out of any cat fight so uh, we're going to call it the enforcer this is going to be a really cool build i'll try to film this for everyone um, to see this build go together as well so that you can see an actual build and get to see some of the end results and specs 
um, on an Ultra. So I'm glad that came. I was hoping it was mine, but it's not. It's Matt's, and you deserve it more anyway. So I'm glad you got it, brother. Um, okay, so the next question here is from the Brad of all Brads, which is you know, one of the funniest guys on social media. Um, I actually had to watch his Titanic um, themed video that he had. I watched that just the other day. Um, with a bunch of people at dinner at the ATA show just for a good hard laugh. So um, that is a classic if you can find it. It was hilarious. It was a video that he posted following his trip here um, when he won one of the knock-on awards for Social Butterfly. Um, But anyway, Brad's question is on the hand placement on the three different releases. Um, And what he's meaning by that is the three releases that are going to be coming will be the Too Smooth, the Silverback, which is already out, and the Knock To It. So he's talking about hand placement on the three releases. um, And specifically, he wants to know how how I'm getting consistent placement between the row of my knuckles. He's saying because there's a gap between you know your knuckles so he's wanting to make sure that he's consistent with where that placement is do you use the edge of the casing to help you feel it in the same place each time since there's room between your first and second knuckle um, there is room for inconsistency what cues do you use um, to know and feel that it's in the same place each time for me i use the edge of the casing either on the first or second knuckle Um, and he said that, uh, the two gives the release an entirely different feel. Um, is your release closer to the first knuckle or the second? Um, so I would say my release is more towards what I would call the center of my hand. So there's room when you stack it between your row of knuckles there is room in between there when you curl your hand around and i like to you know a lot of times i'll like to curl them around so that i'll touch my my pinky and my ring finger back to my palm so that it seats in that correct position and it should seat up and towards the the knuckles that are closer to your fist so in other words i'm calling knuckle number one your fist knuckle knuckle number two is the main center bendable knuckle knuckle number three would be the end knuckle on your fingers i have it closer to knuckle number two and when i curl my fingers down they actually naturally make a slight angle so that it will actually stack up against there and as i'm drawing back you can see i've or those of you watching i've built calluses just from where my fingers are back on my release hand as I draw them back and where those are tucked under. Um, The other thing too is you'll notice on your hand if you take your hand and hold it out in front of you and you curl your fingers down and act like you're wrapping them around a release you'll notice that the ergonomics of your hand actually slope down from your middle finger down to the pinky finger so with the releases they're pretty much set up so that when you stay in that same ergonomic position you should actually force your um, your loop to one side of the release as well um, which helps with consistency off the hook so brad hope that helps you out dude um, hope it helps everybody out, but I guess more importantly, Brad, because he's he's a special person. I'm gonna I'm gonna wet my whistle here for one second. For those of you who have never watched me or seen me, and have only listened to podcasts, that noise means one thing: there's a yeti in the house, which is I pretty much drink out of a yeti exclusively now. Um, the problem is, I don't know, there's a couple things I was thinking this morning that are problems, real life problems we need to solve. One is, 
How do you put something into Yeti and put a lid on it and it literally gets like 15 degrees hotter? I mean, if the cup is room temperature, you put something in at a temperature and then put the lid on it. How does when I actually take my first drink of coffee, it tastes like hot lava? <laughs> I want to know that because it's drinkable when before I put the lid on, I can sip it and it's good. But as soon as I put my lid on so I don't spill it going downstairs to my hot tub in the morning, and then I take that first sip, um, I'm surprised I don't have this big callus on the front of my lip from how many times I've, I've burned it with my morning coffee. Um, and then the other thing that I think is a real life problem, and the only people who are going to know what I mean by this are any of you out there who have bought the Onnit TPC packs. If you've bought an Onnit TPC pack, we need to have a we need to do a petition or a pledge to try to get them to make a pack of seven day packs, only the day packs, because every time I'm done with my box of day and night packs, I swear I forget probably five out of 15 night packs. I'm on the ball for my morning packs, but the night packs, I swear I'm always like five over. By the time I get done with a year, uh, I could be out on the playground pawning off TPC night packs for a month straight. It still won't be caught up to even. So we need to, uh, on it, you need to bring out a seven day morning day pack just so that um, all of us who are too stupid to remember to, to have our vitamins at night can can have equal vitamins and catch up. So if you hear that noise, that's my Yeti. So I apologize for it. It's kind of hard to keep it quiet. But I have to wet my whistle. Otherwise, I'll start coughing. Um, all right. So the next question here is from, I think it's A Piazza 89 uh, saying, I've been shooting my silverback and my true fire sear together lately their hooks aren't in the same exact position so i have to address adjust my anchor point in order to see through my peep to get the same point of impact um it says any thoughts or recommendations and will the two smooth have the same hook position um as the silverback and the knock to it so that's a really good question and a very common one so one of the downsides to any type of um, hinge style release is that the hinge, because of the way it pivots, it normally is further out in front of the finger. So a lot of times you're not going to really be able to get that hinge to match up directly with a different type of release. And that was one reason why on the very first version of the two smooth it was the same type of problem i had brought it back um, with jerry as much as he said we possibly could um, brought it way back so that it could get close but with the very first version it was when you line up the holes it was still pretty far out in front um, of that release so I told him, you know, we need to make another change. So went through, made another change, made another change to the actual back of the housing to bring the index finger further forward. And that way with the um, too smooth, when you line it up, you can see that the draw lengths actually will be pretty much within a 16th, maybe an eighth, and it really depends honestly on where you have your head set because the really cool thing about the Too Smooth is that it does have the ability to adjust your head to a position, the hingeable head to a position that you like to naturally have your hand sitting at at full draw so that you can actually have your hand sitting in a certain position before you start your movement through the moons and for those of you who aren't hinge shooters 
this probably sounds like a foreign language to you, which brings me to a very, very good subject. So one of the things that I'm really striving for is on the two smooths, it's going to be really important that one, I have a very, very clear and proper instructional video for you guys out there and gals to know how to use a hinge release because there's so many benefits to a hinge um, and it's a totally different style, different feel. There's certainly people that really like a hinge style release, but there is a drawing, uh, a learning curve on drawing back with the hinge release. If you draw it back like most people do with a two finger uh, knock to it, where they're putting more pressure on the middle finger, ring finger, as you pull back, almost pulling it like squeezing your fists and pulling it back. If you're pulling it back like that, one, you're not even going to be able to really keep the loop on the hook. The hook's going to want to keep flipping open and ultimately firing, and you know, you're going to end up having a misfire as you're drawing the bow, which isn't fun. Um, so what I'm going to do is make sure that I talk with you about that they'll probably come out of the package with plenty of movement plenty of travel uh, for people who get them out of the package for the first time so they can draw back and understand them um, i may even have them set up with the click um, just for safety reasons um, so you're going to be able to have the option to make a click on this release and make it as long or short of a click as you want and what the click is it's a little, um, it's pretty much a step on the release to where as you start to pivot the release and move the release, the hook hits this little step and you'll hear a little tick. And that little tick tells you that you're right pretty much on the, on the edge of the cliff, um, so to speak. And from there, as you're starting that last little bit of pull, it is ready to fire and it's most likely going to fire. So that's the point of a clicker. I'm not a fan of the clicker from an anticipation point of view, um, but from a safety point of view for a lot of people out there who are gonna get these and have never tried them, I think it'll be important. The other thing too is I'm trying diligently to make sure that Hopefully, the guys at Right Release can get some of the knock on version Right Releases to us because I would really like to be able to offer these to sell in a knock on version to where I can show you how to properly use this release first by having a shot simulator to where you can learn to draw back, learn what you can do with your hand or what you can't do with your hand. Uh, in order to make it fire so it's going to be really important that hopefully I have this otherwise even be, you being patient learning with a piece of string can be good but you know learning to to execute um, with this right release is going to be imperative and I'll make sure that I have a video uh, for you uh, about that so uh, next question here is from Wapiti Fit. He's saying, are you taking questions? And if so, can you dive into some arrow building for the vertically challenged folks? Um, he's saying that he likes the 4 millimeter FMJ. Um, what degree can you get away with? So a 4 millimeter FMJ is a small diameter shaft. Um, it's, it's the smallest um, shaft that you can get in the full metal jacket option. So there's a couple, be there's benefits um, as well as, in my opinion, um, there's some, and this goes for all micro diameter shafts. There's also some, um, some things that could be viewed as negatives. Um, I'm a bigger believer in the five millimeter, um, mostly because of the component option. Um, as well as the overall size of the knock. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. If you're a person that does not shoot lighted knocks, then the knock that comes standard with the injection is a very good knock 
um, super rigid. Um, it's an accurate knock. It's a good one. Um, but the deep six, like this four millimeter uh, FMJ that he's talking about, it has a deep six uh, insert, which means that you have to have a smaller insert. So if you have a bunch of standard broadheads, that would have been a downside is that you wouldn't have been able to use them. However, um, Easton is now making small little components that actually fit in the end of the four millimeter FMJs that then taper up so that you can use a standard insert um, in that bushing. So that's good that you now have the option to use this micro diameter shaft. The benefits to the micro diameter is going to be uh, less wind drift for sure. It's a smaller diameter so it'll have less wind drift. Um, it should penetrate better because it's a smaller diameter, so it should have less drag. Um, but one of the downsides is exactly what uh, Wapiti Fit is talking about, is the fact that since the diameter is so small, you will have limitations to how much offset or helical you can put on the vein before it'll actually start to fall off the edge of the shaft or not fit the edge of the shaft. So in those cases, what I would recommend is um, if you're shooting a longer vein, you're gonna be a little bit more limited to uh, the angle or offset that you can use because the longer the vein, the sooner it's gonna touch at the bottom and the top, right? So a shorter vein will allow you more offset. And keeping that in mind, uh, what you could do is on the four millimeter, you'll actually could do a four fletch on this with a pretty good offset and it would be a really good combination to have. Otherwise, the combination that, um, that we're using right now with Adam Greentree's setup is he's actually using a, um, a max stealth vein. So it's a three inch low profile vein that we have. And he's pretty much got it set as far as he can so that the bottom edge is on the outside edge of the shaft and the top edge is on the outside of the other side of the shaft so that you have perfect coverage bottom all the way to the top. Um, and it's pretty easy to, to know that. Just take your arrow, set it in your jig, put a vein in the clamp, set the clamp down, and just look to see how your contact is sitting on the edge of that vein. You don't want to have any lift to where you can see any type of space or air in there as well. Um, so in regards to vertically challenged, that's, um, that's a, that could be a span of at least two feet. So that's kind of a vague term for me. Um, there's a lot of options. Honestly, Sharon and Harry both shoot a very short arrow. And for hunting, um, I've always had them in either the Axis 5mm or 6mm. Um, that's a good shaft. If you like the smaller diameter FMJs, like the 4mm, then obviously uh, choosing one of those that's in your spine size is correct too. Obviously, there's a lot that goes into picking the right arrow. This is one of the questions that I continually get asked on social media and it's one of the ones that I'm most likely to skip because one I've talked about it a lot in uh, podcasts so if you're asking me questions but have never looked at a post read what I wrote in the post or actually listened to a podcast first or if you're a new podcast listener it's easy to just go on YouTube type in John Dudley and your subject and you're probably going to find a video that can uh, roughly answer that question but for me to tell every single person what arrow size they need um, I would need about 10 of me to cover that and sometimes people ask a question in a post that's the answer is actually in the post if they would just read the post so I do ask make sure you read the post and uh, if you have a question for me, and I'm not I'm not picking on you, Wapiti, but uh, make sure you kind of just do a little quick YouTube or Google search to see if you can 
find that um, because a lot of that stuff is out there on the newer stuff not so much especially something specific like this not so much uh, but otherwise yes yeah. so um, let's see here uh, mag 25x um, is kind of talking here um, specifically about strings and is saying that some people who are making aftermarket strings on the new Hoyts um, are serving the new bottom split yoke all the way down to the loop. Um, so there's a split yoke on the new Hoyts. Pretty much comes down. The way the cables are made from Hoyt, there's actually a gap from the serving to where it goes around this small piece that splits the, the cables. And there's a, a small gap there. A lot of people are running that serving all the way down. What you have to watch for on that is you really have to watch for that small piece starting to twist. If it's not done correctly and they're done a specific way for a reason, it'll start to twist and you'll start to get contact on your cable uh, on the cam itself. So you definitely want to make sure that that thing is perfectly perpendicular and parallel to you as a shooter it's made specifically the cable is made that way for a reason and it's actually tied a very specific way uh, to do that so make sure that when you put if you do do a replacement make sure you're not getting them built in a way that it's turning those cables some to the side to where you're losing clearance on one side or another um, of the cam so rj clockmaker is kind of talking about um that i'd mentioned some other string companies aren't meeting my expectations um specifically about that it was about the ones that i'd used in the past um when i was using um i just feel like um as a whole um just a lot of the last batches of winner's choice that i had gotten um weren't i guess they weren't to my expectations um i don't want to get super thorough just because i don't you know i kind of have to i want to give you guys my opinion on something without literally talking down or or negative about someone um so i mean from my aspect i'm just telling you why I didn't like them. In regards to other ones, RJ's asking me, can I be specific about why other strings aren't working? Um, I bought about five different strings that were on the market, and um, a lot goes into strings, not just the appearance or if they can put an extra strand through the string or whether or not um, the servings look tight, there's a lot more that goes into that. And especially for me, I've built strings for 20 years. I've been part of probably, I would say, between Matthews, Hoyt, and Winner's Choice, which I know all three of those processes very well. Um, I just can say I know a lot about do's and don'ts to string making. And some of the ones that I have that I've gotten have had a lot of things that are great and some things that aren't. And um, part of the reason why I want to make my own strings, I don't know how many models I'm going to decide to dive into. Um, I'm going to probably focus on models that I'm familiar with. If I'm if that keeps us busy enough to where I'm at the max capacity I can be at for um, building space and employees. Um, that we have in the area, then that's where I'm going to cap it at. You know, I'm not trying to make a string company that's going to be the biggest in the world. I just want to make something that's that's a product that goes back to um, what I want on my bow and what I want to put on other people's bows, and that's really what it boils down to. Um, I know what I need to do to be a hundred percent on every single aspect of a string and i've brought a lot of people here i've bought every single type of machine that you can buy on the market and what most people are using right now and they haven't held up to what i want them to do i'm not saying that there's i know there's some good strings out there 
Um, there may be some great strings out there, uh, but I want to I wanna have control on what I have. And, you know, I don't like it when I order six strings and one string goes on my bow and it's awesome. And then I put another string on a buddy's bow and uh, he has a cable separation a week later or another guy's peep is turning a 16th of a turn or uh, another guy might have an end loop that pops and unravels all that little stuff just adds up to me and i just feel like i'm not a bow company so i know that for me and i think my followers which are you um, i could easily make what i want i can tell you why it's why I feel like it's better, I can stand behind it, and I feel confident that you guys can go out there knowing that you have uh, the best mis- you know the best stuff on the market where I haven't cut corners. Uh, one of the questions I know that's coming up is about the elevate rests. Um, I made another change on the elevate rest, not because I had to because I wanted to. I had another idea about something so i ran it by nick at the ata show asked him how long it would take for him to make it happen and you know he said well it's going to change the cost a little bit and i i'm willing to absorb that i'm cool with that if it's if in the back of my mind i know there's one little thing that i didn't think about that can make that better um then i choose to do it so um as soon as the mold's done they're they're you know they're molding them they're injecting them so as soon as those get done and come out um then they'll be available again i took everything that we had here um in inventory um which was actually not anything in right-handed but lefties and freak bars and and some of the odd and end stuff and sent them back and said i want them all this exact way um so that's just what i want to do so um Hopefully you all appreciate that. The same has been true. Um, there's times where there were batches of Noctuits um, that came in that, you know, had something slightly off and, you know, I made a, a quick change to it. One thing I do definitely need to talk about is I actually misspoke the other day when I was talking specifically um, about the spring adjustment in the Noctuit. Um, I talked about people having the option of removing that top screw and dropping another spring in. I actually forgot that one thing that we had changed with this system is that it's actually not like an ITS system, which is one of the predecessors in the Carter lineup where you actually could drop in different compression springs this system as a whole is literally built so that the one spring that is in there for the trigger spring actually runs the full spectrum of all three springs that you used to get so i misspoke there Um, i kind of knew that the spring that came in it they were always set where i liked them to and I knew that there was a bag that came in there. I thought that was for the two other springs, like what comes with the silverback. Even though I had never used them, I just assumed that, that that's what they were. Um, so the spring that's in there is pretty much the one that's going to give you the full range of coverage of everything that you need. Um, the small springs that come with the silverback won't actually fit in the hole. Both of the springs are custom to what I wanted and what I used to shoot uh, years ago. So if you have like an old wise choice and you cock that and you fire it, you'll feel it'll be a completely different feel and a completely different sound. And that's why. Um, The next question here was from Hargo734. He was asking about info on the new outsert insert from Easton for the four millimeter shaft. So Um, I did talk about that for you. Um, They're nice. Uh, The only thing is just, you know, you're pretty much adding an extra inch to your arrow shaft. So it's good because you can use a standard broadhead. It's great from that aspect. Um, However, just remember that you do have, at least from my point of view, and I'm a little bit weird, uh, I've got, you know, it's an extra inch overhang. 
Um, so for me, because my draw length is so long and the number one problem I have ballistically is the length of the arrow has a lot of surface area. So I try to minimize that as much as I possibly can. So even that little extra inch um, is you know a little bit different. The other thing too is keep in mind that you know depending on the length of the shaft or the the peg of the insert and as it goes in there you know the length of that it's actually not going to be as long as if you had a deep six inset down in there um, so it's a little bit shorter and if you're kind of right on that bubble of arrow shaft selection based on the spine chart i would recommend you favor the stiffer arrow side of things um, just because the actual shank of that insert is not as far in there and you have a little bit longer overall span when it comes to you know the paradox or the flex of the arrow so favor that stiff side if you're on the bubble uh, let's see here. Next question is from Photo Dude 2155 saying, Hey, Dud, I noticed um, you have cock feather out. Um, is that on most dropaways or just your elevate or is it your personal preference? And then um, my buddy from uh, County Line Firearms stepped in and kind of just talked about with most fall away rests, you shoot cock vein up. And that is true. For the longest time, that was true, but it's not completely accurate. So on a lot of the newer style bows, now on the, the brand new one, with on the RX-1 with the new cam system, this isn't so much the case because you actually have full clearance on the inside of your riser. So, but on the other types of bows where they have a flexible cable guard or where the cables are kind of being favored as close in as they possibly can there's reason for this one when it's pulled over to the side too far um, it starts to cause cam lean so they're trying to bring it in as close as possible to minimize cam lean with the new system that's on the RX-1, because it's a dual cable track, um, you don't have to worry about that as much because that center, that center piece is actually compensating for that and helping you with that lean. So they're actually able to not have a flexible roller guard. The roller guard is in a fixed position and you have really good clearance on the inside. Now in the past with the flexible ones or the ones that they've brought really close to the inside, um, you know, and the closer you bring it to the center of the bow, your cables and cable uh, slide is what I'm talking about. The closer you bring them to the center of the bow, the less torsional torque the bow handle will have. So as you're holding that handle, I was trying to see if I have one, as you're holding your bow handle out in front of you, if you push on your rear cable guard, you know, if you take your finger on the right side of your cable rod and push on it, push on it towards the left, you'll notice your bow starts to turn. Now, if you have a sight on your bow, as you do that, you can see that your sight pin will actually move to the right. So if you have a sight pin out here and you push on it, that sight pin is gonna to move to the right on the front of your bow. It's gonna to move towards the right. And so what that tells you is when you have a bow and in a resting position, your pins on your bow are very outside of the arrow shaft. So if the arrow shaft is sitting on the rest straight down the pipe and your pins are sitting an inch outside of your arrow shaft that's telling you that as you draw back the pressure on the rear cable and cable guard system is pushing so hard that it's swinging your pins to where at full draw they're sitting over the center of your arrow shaft 
but at rest they're sitting way out here that shows you the torsional stability on some of the elite bows they were definitely had a lot of swing with the let off the way that cam system works and the fact that it technically was an older style system with the straight limb and a and a uh, a solid rod you know if you pull one back to full draw if you have weight on the end of your stabilizer you can really get that thing to swing and your pins and where they sit on your arrow shaft it's i'm not saying you can't be accurate with it because you can but you have to be more repeatable with it so in those situations where you have those risers that flex like that or those cable rods that flex in those situations that's why i've found indexing my knocks so that i'm actually shooting a cock vein out or technically when i clip my arrow on the string i'm looking so that instead of my cock vein being at 12 o'clock i actually slightly turn it so that it's at about one o'clock looking at the string because i want to have the most clearance from the inside of that vein on the riser in my cables on both the top vein and what would be the bottom vein okay so i'm looking for the best clearance there if you ever have that one or two arrows that you shoot and you all of a sudden see it you know fish tailing down a lot of times the best thing you can do is look at your knock position slightly turn that knock so that you have better clearance uh down the rest so i like I'm not going to say it's cock vein out. I actually like my top vein to be at about 1 o'clock if I'm looking directly over my string. And I found that with most people, that's going to give you uh, the best clearance. So uh, last question here is from Matt.Jones saying, Randomly, I have days where I group all afternoon to the right with my silverback, but it's random. Any tips on identifying the right and left group causes? This tends to be more common um, if I take a break from shooting for a few days. So yeah, one of the things you definitely want to think about is when you haven't shot for a few days, a lot of people start as they're pulling, they're actually pulling out and away from their face. Their elbow position is almost pointing in the wrong place and a lot of times this has to do with people drawing wrong like i talked about at the very beginning of the podcast so if you draw back and then move your head to settle in your elbow can really be at any type of position whereas if you get in the habit of drawing back till the bow stops and then bringing the release over to your face the elbow comes up much higher and is in a much different put place and as you pull through your release can come over the top of the shoulder and straight back in a back line towards 12 o'clock when you start making a fist your hand will be further out away from your face if you make a fist on the release or if you're elbows low and you're starting to come out away from the face as you shoot so an overhead view of that can help you if you're coming out away from the face then you're sending that arrow that way uh, right off the bat so those are two things right there that i think could probably help you uh fix that problem and uh let's see oh Last question actually was, I don't know who asked it. It was someone on Instagram uh, asked the question um, about how he's replacing the strings and cables on his RX-1 and he's wanting to know how do I actually synchronize the cam. So if you look at the directions, it pretty much tells you that you're not supposed to mess with twists that are down on the lower unit because you really don't want to mess with the twisting necessarily of that split system which i talked about however the depth of the top split bus cable is much longer than what it has been in the past and the reason is so that you have a lot of option on both the right and left side of that yoke to add and subtract twists the other thing too is this is a big reason why Hoyt actually made two different 
um, cable clips on the axle because one is much closer to the axle than the other. The one that's closer to the axle is the one that's being pulled the most, which in the past, if you, on any other system, if you had a bow and pretty much every Hoyt before these two uh, cable pieces were made, if you wanted to put a brand new cable on, because the cable's being pulled over to one side, that yoke that would be straight is now being pulled to the side. So one is going to actually have less tension on it than the other. So you would have to shrink down the one that has less tension by twisting it in order to have your cam perfectly balanced. So because both of these clips on the top are now different to where one is closer to the axle, one is above the axle, it, they're actually compensating for you taking those twists and essentially allowing you to twist both sides of your yoke evenly now which gives you more adjustment in order to time uh, that bottom cam so if you have to um, add or take away twists for that for the bottom main power cable do that on your top yoke so I think that'll uh, pretty much wrap up the podcast. I'll do my best to get this posted. May not post today. I might let it post in the morning. But uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in to another podcast. Please, please, please make sure you go on iTunes and give me a review. Hopefully, it's a good one. Um, you know, I know some people say whether it's good or bad doesn't matter. I like good I like good reviews. But uh I think if everybody listened just did one review on iTunes for me, that would instantly quadruple our numbers because some of you do it and maybe I'm not adamant enough about asking. Um but please do it. It helps out big time. And also um I'm really a big advocate of not boosting or I don't pay any companies and I don't boost any of my social media. Um, It is all organic. And I can tell you that we are getting super close to a hundred thousand followers on Instagram. So please, uh, if you know of anyone that has Instagram, word of mouth, I want people there that want to be there. So word of mouth is awesome. And uh, yeah, make sure you check out the new shirts and hats, the Knock on Archery website. I appreciate it. Every little bit helps pay for all this stuff that I do for you. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. And knock on.